Welcome back to the Foxhole. I'm your host, James Rosen, coming to you from the Washington Bureau of Fox News. You can follow me on Twitter, at James Rosen, FNC. Although we are fast losing the surviving members of the greatest generation, at an estimated rate of about 1,000 World War II veterans per day, many historical debates from that tumultuous period remain. Some argue over whether the attack at Pearl Harbor, which plunged the United States into the war, was foreseeable, if not actually decoded and known about in advance, while others still argue about the military necessity and morality of America's use of atomic weapons at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which effectively ended the war. Today, the foxhole looks at still other questions of that era. Did anyone in the U.S. government see the genocidal malignancy of Adolf Hitler at the outset of his reign in Germany? and work to find safe haven for the endangered Jews of Europe. What about Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself? Was he averse to helping the Jews? And what role did the United States, and specifically the State Department, play after the war in the establishment of a Jewish state? Tremendous insight into these questions comes from a trilogy of thick new volumes published jointly by Indiana University Press and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. They comprise the diaries and papers of an American diplomat named James G. MacDonald. Those three volumes, Advocate for the Doomed, Refugees and Rescue, and most recently published in December, To the Gates of Jerusalem, span the years 1932 to 1947. And they are co-edited by four scholars of that era, one of whom, Professor Richard Brightman of American University, is one of the preeminent historians of the Holocaust and our visitor to the Foxhole today. A deep honor to welcome you here today, Richard, to the Foxhole. Uh, tell us, broadly speaking, who was James G. MacDonald? Uh, McDonald was a man who was at the center of political and moral issues of the 1930s and 1940s. Um, he started out as head of something called the Foreign Policy Association. He was appointed League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees coming from Germany. And uh, he worked as a part of an advisor to the Roosevelt administration on refugees. Um, he probably is best known today as the first American ambassador to Israel. Okay, and what years was he was the ambassador to Israel? 1948 to early 1951. Okay, tell us about his diaries and papers. How, how, did, how did scholars get their hands on these? The diaries were in private hands and they were not available to scholars, so uh, they have not been much used in previous histories. Um, his daughter, Barbara, one of our co-editors, had a portion of them, and um, MacDonald had written a volume of uh, memoirs from his Israel years and had used a, a writer as an advisor, and the, somehow part of the diary got stuck with the writer and the writer's family, so um, nobody could see the whole picture because the pieces of the diaries uh, were in different hands. They came together at the Holocaust Museum uh, early in about, about 10 years ago and the museum brought me in to figure out how to get these published and so we've succeeded. Now the different volumes are arrayed on our anchor desk here uh, so our viewers can see them and obviously they cover different uh, time periods uh, in McDonald's career. Uh, starting in 1932, and uh, he was briefly considered for the post of U.S. Ambassador to Germany at the time that Hitler assumed power there in 1933, uh, and he had an early visit with Adolf Hitler in Berlin, correct? That is quite correct, and he wrote about that visit in his diary, and he subsequently talked about it with trusted friends when he came back to the United States. What did he observe about the new Chancellor of Germany, Adolf Hitler? He saw that he was a fanatic, and he saw that Germany was likely, if Hitler stayed in power, to lead the world into war. And he also saw that Hitler was a fanatic on the Jewish question. Uh, MacDonald was using a stenographer when he was in Germany, and he didn't want to say too much. He suspected his room might be bugged. Um, but when he came back, uh, to the United States, he told some trusted friends that Hitler s had said to him, the world does not know how to get rid of the Jews, I will show them. That's incredible. Uh, a lot of debate over the Holocaust centers on the question of whether or not uh, 
it, there was a straight line to Auschwitz or a crooked line to Auschwitz, or a twisted path to Auschwitz, as the literature records. And uh, one wonders if James MacDonald didn't have a very early insight into the straight line to Auschwitz. Well, he did have a view on that question because in 1944, uh, he wrote a letter to the New York Times in which he said, um, you know, now we can see what the Holocaust is. Um, and I had some insight into this in 1933 when Hitler said this to me. So what is your personal view on that subject uh, about whether there was a straight line to Auschwitz or, or a twisted path? Um, my view is kind of split. Um, it's, it's a question of whether you look at the German government as a whole or whether you look at Adolf Hitler. If you look at the German government as a whole, I think you can make an argument that there were fits and starts and um, there was a period of escalation and a period of um, stabilization and then uh, different people got involved and took control and so you see an irreg irregular pattern with Hitler and his ideas, he's very consistent. All the way back to Mein Kampf. Yes. Our visitor to the foxhole today is Professor Richard Brightman of American University, preeminent Holocaust historian and co-editor of a multi-volume collection of the diaries and papers of James G. MacDonald, published by Indiana University Press and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. As we go to the second volume, uh, which covers uh, the period of, what, 1935 to 1938, is it? Or? It goes all the way to 1945. To 45, okay. The a second volume... Period. The second volume is a little different than the first and the third. Um, in the early period, MacDonald wrote a ton in his diary. Um, in 1936, he stopped keeping a diary, and therefore we had to fill a gap between 1936 and 1945. So we've got, we start with diary, and then we um, created a mosaic of primary sources from McDonald's letters, from newspaper articles about McDonald, uh, government documents, other people's diaries. Memoranda. Memoranda. So we, we kept the story focused on McDonald and refugees from Germany and the Holocaust, but without a proper diary for most of that period. In 1946, he started keeping a diary again, and so we go back to the story of how the United States and Great Britain created a committee to recommend a solution for Jews in Europe and Palestine, a committee that hardly anyone rec remembers today, and yet the hearings and the testimony and the dialogue uh, and the debate within this committee echo all of the major issues of the period 1945 to 1948, and some of those issues are still alive today. Now, you are also the co-author of one of your most acclaimed works, FDR and the Jews, uh, co-authored co with Alan Lichtman, also of American University, published in 2013. So you've researched quite intensively uh, the question of FDR, uh, how much he knew about the final solution, uh, the deliberations over whether or not Auschwitz and the rail lines leading into it might be bombed by the Allies, uh, the decision-making by John McCloy at, at that time, and, and, and all of those issues. Uh, but the second volume of the McDonald Papers touches directly on that, correct? It does, but McDonald had a limited access to the president during the period 1942 to 1945 and we kept the focus there more on McDonald than on Roosevelt. We, Of course, whenever McDonald got in to see Roosevelt or Eleanor Roosevelt, it's, it's in that second volume. And what should Americans understand in broad terms about FDR and his views on how much help the United States and the Allies should be affording to the Jews at a period where perhaps all the details of the final solution weren't known by any means, but certainly their plight in broad strokes was known. We know roughly when Roosevelt found out about the Holocaust, and it's the period November, December 1942. He had some information before then. You can argue he should have realized uh, more before then, but um, the evidence is pretty good that uh, a combination of sources reported very blunt conclusions to Sumner Wells and then 
Sumner Wells to Roosevelt in November 1942. Roosevelt met with a delegation of Jewish leaders on December 8, 1942. Um, he let them present evidence. He said he was familiar with it. Um, he said it's a very difficult problem because we're fighting a war and it's very hard to see what else we can do other than fight the war as aggressively in Europe as we possibly can. He was not attuned to all of the diplomatic issues that uh, we've come to realize might have been addressed in 1943. And it took a bit of pressure. You mean um, uh, allowing endangered Jews to emigrate to the United States? Uh, that's one of many issues, uh, encouraging neutral countries like Switzerland and Turkey to take in Jews. Uh, there were a number of rescue possibilities, getting money in to support starving Jews um, from Jewish sources, figuring out a way to do that without helping the Axis war effort. Bottom line, did FDR do all he could have done given what he knew and when? No. But Why do you suppose that was? Uh, I think Roosevelt was focused on winning the war, and it took a lot to convince him and it took military victories to convince him that one could do other things beyond winning the war in order to help Jews. And it took some argument from the Treasury Department and his Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, Jr. Our visitor to the foxhole today is Professor Richard Brightman of American University, preeminent Holocaust historian and co-editor of a multi-volume collection of the diaries and papers of American diplomat James G. MacDonald, published by Indiana University Press and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Now take us through the third volume here to the Gates of Jerusalem, uh, the third of four projected volumes. Uh, this is the one just published in December. And uh, it, it takes us to uh, just on the cusp of the creation of the uh, Jewish state. It does. Uh, and you mentioned this committee that, that MacDonald served on at that time. Tell us about that committee. Britain and the United States created a committee of experts to recommend a solution. Uh, they had different views of what the problem was. Britain said the problem is there are all these Jews displaced in Europe and we probably ought to arrange for them to go back to their homes in Europe. The United States said, well, some of them at least want to go to Palestine. And you haven't even mentioned Palestine in talking about this committee. So they got together and said, well, we'll create a committee to survey the condition of Jews in Europe and Palestine. And the British expected a pro-Arab report about Palestine, and they stacked their delegation to get it. The State Department was quite willing to go along with that. In fact, some State Department officials were eager to go along with that. But MacDonald got on the committee, and he didn't agree with that at all. And slowly but surely, he began to win support from other members of the committee, first on the American side and later on the British side. They fought over everything. They, they toured Europe. They toured the Middle East. They went to Egypt, they went to Saudi Arabia, they went to Lebanon, they went to Syria, they talked to all of the key people. They encountered an astounding level of anti-Semitism in the Middle East. Um, some of the quotes in there are very blunt about um, what Jews are like. Um, they then retreated to Lausanne, as it happens, a uh, good place for diplomacy. Um, and they fought over their final recommendations. Their final report was a compromise, but it was a compromise that gave Harry Truman what he most wanted, which was admit 100,000 Jews to Palestine immediately and will determine the ultimate political shape of Palestine later. It's premature to do that now. The British refused to accept the report. 
two quick questions before I want to switch topics with you. Um, by many accounts, the State Department, around the time of the founding of Israel, was itself riven with anti-Semitism, uh, perhaps a, a tweedier strain of it. Why did this, uh, how, or how did uh, McDonald somehow uh, come of age through the Foreign Service and yet uh, not fall prey to that same strain of anti-Semitism? What motivated him to help the Jews? Uh, you have to remember McDonald was um, an outsider. Um, he wasn't a professional State Department official. He wanted to be, um, but he never really made it until he was appointed as ambassador to Israel. So uh, he was somebody who had built up, um, you know, years of contacts, uh, you know, weekly contacts with major American Jewish leaders, uh, Jewish leaders in other countries. Um, he liked to think he was on good terms with government officials, and he was on good terms with some of them, but he never made much headway with the State Department. And when he raised the subject uh, with Truman of, you know, getting a State Department appointment, it didn't go anywhere. So he wasn't a career State Department person. Okay, but he nonetheless eventually became the first U.S. ambassador to the newly created State of Israel. And, and just very quickly, what would you say, and I know this is a subject for the next uh, fourth and final volume of these papers, uh, which will take us from 1948 onward, uh, but what would you say uh, McDonald's uh, legacy was in terms of the uh, early establishment of Israel as the first U.S. ambassador over there? What did he accomplish? How important is he to, to the early survival of Israel? Uh, in her visit uh, several years ago to Israel, um, Barbara McDonald Stewart, McDonald's daughter, uh, spoke with Shimon Peres, and um, he had an aide present, and the aide apparently didn't know much about McDonald. And Shimon Peres said, McDonald is the origin of the, the relationship between the United States and Israel. Present at the creation. Yes, present at the creation and the one who managed to create um, not only friendly bonds, but strong bonds over the vehement opposition of the State Department. When will we see the fourth and final volume? Uh, I would guess it's about two years away. Okay. Um, to switch topics a bit and focus on your own work as a historian, um, you are the author of Architect of Genocide, Himmler and the Final Solution, published in 1991, thought by many to be the definitive biography of Heinrich Himmler, the uh, SS Reichsfuhrer who uh, presided over the, the Holocaust and, the, and specifically the attempt to exterminate European Jewry. Uh, you are the author in 1998 of Official Secrets, What the Nazis Planned, What the British and American Knew, which surveyed uh, newly declassified evidence from uh, various uh, archives uh, showing just how much information about the final solution was in the hands of the Allies as it unfolded. And then most recently, as we mentioned earlier, the co-author with Alan Lichtman, also of American University of FDR and the Jews, published in 2013. Uh, I hope you won't mind if I mention that just before we started taping, you mentioned that you look back on the Himmler book, which has been very influential, and you said to me that you got some things right and some things wrong. What, what did you get wrong? I had to infer from Himmler's daily appointments um, what he had discussed with people, because in some cases there was little or no documentation about those meetings other than the fact that a particular person met with Himmler, let's say, on August 24th, 1942. Uh, I got the subjects right in some cases because some Later historians found additional evidence, and in some cases I assumed because of their position that they were discussing one subject and they were actually more interested in another subject. I was dealing with fragmentary evidence and making inferences. Has that book gone through successive uh, reissues? It's in Has paperback. It's still in print. Did you have a chance to correct the, things, the minor things you got wrong? Uh, I made a few corrections, yes. Okay. Um, in, uh, I think, 2013 it was, um, yeah, early 2013, I 
Holocaust historian named Peter Longerich published um, a longer book called simply Heinrich Himmler. Uh, do you regard that book as a as a as a kind of a an elaboration upon yours as a as a as a as a more definitive biography or what would you say about Longrich's book? It's a fuller biography. I was focused on the issue of planning the Holocaust, and I of course looked at Himmler the man, and I gave some overview of his overall range of activities, but I wasn't, I didn't see myself as writing a biography in the traditional sense where uh, you regard as relevant everything from what the guy ate for breakfast to uh, the last thing he did at night. Cradle to grave, if you will. Exactly. Longerish is a traditional biography. Now, uh, do I agree with him on everything? No, we have a different sense of when uh, Himmler understood the final solution of the Jewish question to be a clear program and when Himmler began to uh, carry it out consciously. Um, but it's certainly a very uh, respectable biography and I agree with him about Himmler the man. That's what he was like. Um, we just have about a 60 seconds left. Uh, what would you identify as the most fruitful areas for Holocaust research and writing uh, still ahead of us that uh, aspiring scholars could, could undertake? Well, you know, um, the archives of Eastern European countries uh, have only been open a relatively short time. And uh, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum has an extensive program of microfilming or otherwise copying archival documents from Eastern Europe. And so I, I think we've just, you know, we've done a little more than tap the surface, but um, there's undoubtedly going to be uh, decades of research and writing about the interaction between Nazis, Jews, collaborating countries, and bystanders uh, in Eastern European countries. Our visitor to the foxhole today has been an intellectual hero of mine, Professor Richard Brightman of American University, preeminent Holocaust historian and co-editor of a three-volume collection, soon to become a four-volume collection, of the Diaries and Papers of James G. MacDonald, published by Indiana University Press and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. That's going to do it for this episode of the foxhole. I'm your host, James Rosen, signing off from the Washington Bureau of Fox News. You can follow me on Twitter, at James Rosen. FNC, and we will FNC you later.